Okay, Lisa, I reckon we're ready to go ahead and make a start. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar today. Um, the topic of the webinar is about the Nightingale Challenge and how the Nightingale Challenge programmes across the world are adapting to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're incredibly privileged this afternoon to have some really esteemed speakers with us from different parts of the world. We've got Chief Nurse Julie Pearce from Marie Curie UK, Professor Honis Ortigo from the University of Miami, and Anna Julia Leme from the Hospital Israeli Albert Einstein. Next slide, please. And just so that people know, and I'll just put my um, video on now, I'm, I'm uh, very privileged to be the programme lead for the Nightingale Challenge um, and have been part of it since the beginning. And I work very closely with two other colleagues. Um, one is Matt Daly, who is the um, fellow um, for the challenge, and also um, Anthony that you can't see on the screen, but has been integral to setting up this webinar today, works very closely on this program with us. So as we can see with the Nightingale Challenge, in spite of um, COVID, we are still seeing people enroll onto the program, which is fantastic. Um, we've now got just under 28,000 early career nurses and midwives enrolled with 732 employers across 73 countries. And we're still actively counting and recruiting onto this initiative. So what have we been doing with the Nightingale Challenge since um, the pandemic COVID uh, came to being across the world? Well, as you would expect, uh, we quickly responded by identifying and developing a number of resources with the support of the Nightingale Challenge network that we have so that we could be helpful, hopefully, to people that are trying to learn to adapt and care in communities where, where COVID is, is rampant and ripping through the communities. We are also um, have made sure that we've, we've done some topics around health and wellbeing um, and compassion and, and other areas as well, which I'm now going to let uh, Matt um, share with you in relation to this element of our work. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so with the COVID-19 resources, there's a lot of shared resources that we've made available on the website. Um, on the Nursing, Nursing Now website. Um, there's databases, there's training resources and information from 10 global organisations, including the uh, World Health Organisation and ICN. And these cover areas such as clinical leadership and occupational as well. The examples of, uh, as well as today of how we've adapted to the COVID, um, it would be very interesting to see what your examples are and how you've changed. We've got webinar recordings and larger resources of programmes and development opportunities that are on the um, Nursing Now uh, website that is available to all. Um, but we're very interested in how you can use these and how your, um, exa your programmes have changed. And we'd really like to know and to share your stories as well. And also, what can we share? What can we share between each other? We can share your stories of COVID-19, but also your plans for the future um, and what we can share between us. If you're interested in participating in, in, global, par in global partnerships, working with your colleagues and organisations around the world that are involved in the Nice Care Challenge, um, please contact us with your aspirations of finding a partner and let us know what you'd like us to or what you, you would like to share and experience um, and explore what you're looking for in return to develop your global relationships with others like you and as part of this we're also looking at how we can solve problems together a lot of the issues have shared so looking at a global solutions initiative that we can tell you more about as time goes on we also have the poetry portal as well and this offers support and insight for those who have lived through the experience of being the health worker within the COVID-19 period um, it's an opportunity to share your poetry. Uh, we have 24 poems so far submitted by nurses and midwives during this period, uh, during, during the pandemic. Um, and we continue to encourage you to share so that we can share amongst ourselves as well. Great, thank you for that, Matt. And is it just worth flagging 
how many partnerships, how many, how many different organisations we've been able to connect so far on our Nightingale Challenge journey. Certainly, yeah. So, so much with the, um, to date with so far, we've got 83 partnerships between 83 organisations um, throughout the world working together um, in 33 different countries. Uh, we have we actively encourage those who want to get engaged and um, to let us know. And we are actively seeking to match another 10 at the moment, but obviously continue as people wish to come forward. Great. Thank you for that, Matt. So do look out on our website for, for some really helpful facts around um, dealing with things like COVID through to health and well-being agendas and initiatives uh, such as sharing uh, poetry and, and compassionate ideas so that we can really continue to build this global network of early career nurses and midwives for each other, with each other, um, so that ultimately you feel empowered to be brilliant advocates for the patients and communities that you care and work within. And just before we move on further now to our speakers, I do just want to say that we are going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation. And therefore, if you've got questions, um, please put them into the chat box and we can work at answering them when we come to the question and answer session. If we run out of time, then we can um, make sure that we post the answers onto the website for you. So don't worry if we don't get to your question right here um, this afternoon. We will get back to you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Great. Over now then to our first esteemed speaker, which is um, Julie Pierce, the Chief Nurse and Executive Director of Quality and Caring Services at Marie Curie UK. Thank you, Julia. Right, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully this is going to work. Right, can everybody see that hopefully? So um, hello everybody and it's really fantastic to be part of this worldwide event and challenge um, celebrating I think the art and science of nursing across the world and all of our specialties and the settings in which uh, nursing takes place. So Marie Curie, um, we're very uh, privileged to be part of this and we're really excited to be part of it. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit um, uh, about our participants and a little bit about Marie Curie. Uh, Marie Curie is a charity. Uh, we provide um, end of life care and palliative care to around 50,000 people in the UK. UK each year and that's into our four nations uh, that make up the, the, the UK. Um, we're commissioned to provide those services through the National Health Service uh, within uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, we employ around a thousand registered nurses um, who provide care in our community nursing services uh, so that is into people's homes um, as well as into our hospices as well. Um, um, we have probably around uh, 3,000 clinical staff altogether uh, and 1,000 of those are registered nurses. The pictures that you see on the screen really are a number of our participants in our leadership program. Um, we have we started our journey on this in December of last year where we signed up to the program and started to recruit our cohort of leaders. And our aspiration really was to actively support them in their leadership development um, and we base all of our leadership uh, programs on being very person-centered and compassionate uh, leadership principles where we can enable people to flourish. So we were very um, uh, forthcoming in relation to the number of nurses that came forward that wanted to engage in the program and we went we had a little short um, process for selecting our aspiring leaders for this program and originally we were um, designing the program around normal facilitation mentoring and shadowing uh, a series of master classes and workshops with some interaction um, and also some uh, opportunities for action, uh, active learning um, activities uh, as part of the programme 
design. Um, and we all through our programs, we do um, uh, encourage uh, leaders, aspiring leaders to share their learning and to demonstrate their impact on practice. So we did obviously have to change the approach uh, that we were taking. These are just the key steps in the program that we utilized. Um, and we were originally going to launch our program in March of this year. But then, of course, as everybody is aware, this is when the pandemic really hit us. And in uh, the UK, we really uh, were required to really focus on getting everybody ready for uh, the pandemic or the epidemic that would be happening in the UK and so temporarily we had to suspend uh, the launch of the program but we did go ahead we started to redesign it and looking at whether we could use a slightly different approach and use a much more virtual medium for actually engaging our participants in the program and so we did officially launch the program on the 13th of May and we had our first uh, program masterclass as part of that launch uh, and that was really designed about knowing yourself as a leader. Um, and this just walks you through some of our masterclass workshop sessions that we've got planned. So the first session we've already done, and we did use um, a number of tools as part of this. Uh, the participants went through their Myers-Briggs profiles and also started to understand the impacts, uh, the impact of their leadership style has on other people. Um, we explored a little bit about leadership theories, uh, and also we, we gave people an opportunity to explore some of that and to, to ask questions of of our mentors and our senior team. Uh, session two, we're going to be focusing on building relationships, really enhancing um, our participants' communication skills, giving them um, a one-day workshop to really help to build and enhance their knowledge and skills around effective communication. And that does include communicating and influencing other people as leaders. Um, in session three, we'll be starting to explore some uh, ways in which we can have difficult conversations with our colleagues and we will be supporting that through uh, coaching um, of our participants and helping them to have conversations with people that helps to stretch uh, their team members. So we, we uh, are based this on the philosophy of high support and high challenge so that actually people do start to develop uh, their leadership abilities but also they can develop other Others that are within their teams and the last session really is a celebration of what they the participants will have learnt over the time of the program and they will also be um, able to share what they've um, achieved through their um, work-based project which I'll go into in a moment um, and this really is uh, what we're asking our participants to do is to complete a, a project based on their own work environment uh, this could be any topic at all that's relevant to them so it could have be something around workforce it could be a service development or or a, an aspect of service improvement. We do use quality improvement methodology, so we are encouraging our participants to adopt that as an approach. And what we will do uh, through their mentors and their line managers, we will start to help them to form their ideas around that, take the project forward, and, uh, and we hope um, towards the end of the programme that they will write that up, possibly for publication. Uh, we'll encourage them to do a poster presentation uh, and also a five minute presentation to the rest of their colleagues and senior leaders within Marie Curie as a charity. The mentorship relationship is very important in all of our leadership programs. So we had no problems actually recruiting mentors uh, to support um, our aspiring leaders. Uh, they are able to provide regular support and coaching conversations. They're able to provide guidance and opportunities for personal development. They have a, a, at least a monthly catch up um, and also uh, I think it's important to say that our mentors come from a range right across our organization so we have clinicians we have fundraisers we have our chief executive is one of our mentors um, and is actually mentoring one of our community nurses that um, happens to practice in England um, and uh, 
there was a significant interest, I think, from our senior leaders across our organisation, and really because this helps them with their own personal development as well. Uh, I think this just helps us uh, think about what are the principles that we are hoping for success through this leadership program. And I think what's important is that we empower people to really accomplish their personal goals. Um, and our first session was really a good starting point and, and a very important principle of knowing yourself. Uh, so our learning so far, so our first um, virtual uh, masterclass, this was some of the feedback. Um, we had lots of feedback from our participants uh, and this just encapsulates some of the, uh, the feedback that we had from three people. Um, and I think this is about building confidence, uh, encouraging people to engage um, and really reflect on their own personal learning about themselves as leaders and being really mindful uh, that actually the, the journey is a personal one for them, but also they can learn from others, their mentors, but also the other participants uh, within the programme. So our learning so far is that virtually um, it's worked and been quite successful. Uh, we've also learnt that actually it's really good to be able to focus on something else other than COVID-19. Uh, obviously that is happening in the background and all of our clinicians, our participants have had to learn and adapt how to use PPE and to uh, work through their practice uh, in a very different way. Uh, but it's also really good to be able to focus on, on some other things. Our second virtual masterclass will be in July uh, and we're also uh, encouraging some shadowing opportunities with our senior leaders and those will be uh, opportunities that again they can join uh, through virtual meetings uh, with their experienced leaders. So uh, some of the executive uh, meetings or other meetings that they may well want to, to join in just to listen and to uh, reflect on those. Uh, and throughout the programme, we will be evaluating the impact on them personally, but also what the impact is on their team and on their, uh, on their practice as well. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. Julie, thank you so much. And uh, that's really inspirational and actually heartwarming um, to see the programme still continuing. And yes, it's adapted, but um, nevertheless, you've still been able to make it work. And I think hats off to your chief executive officer, actually, for taking up the challenge of, uh, of being a mentor. It was, it was one of the suggestions we put into the kind of toolkit and the brochure when we first launched Nightingale Challenge, because it's really that opportunity for these um, early career nurses and midwives to really understand who and where some of the influences lie. So um, thank you, you've, you've really made, me, made my day, uh, really enjoyed that presentation. And I'm sure that this one is going to be equally as, um, as exciting and interesting. So we're now going to uh, Yonis, um, uh, who's going to talk about how he's been adapting the Nightingale Challenge uh, programme uh, in Miami. Over to you, Yonis. Good morning, everyone, and actually good afternoon for most of the participants. Uh, my name is Johis Ortega, and I'm the Associate Dean for Hemispheric and Global Initiative at the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies. It is my honor to be part of this webinar. Uh, the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies has also accepted Nursing Now Nightingale Challenge to foster leadership skills in over 20,000 emergency nurses worldwide in 2020. Our initial goal was to provide leadership and development training to 20 early career nurses working in South Florida, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Uh, you're gonna see through the presentation that the, we were able to accomplish that goal and actually we did better than 20. So before I continue my presentation, this um, um, Nightingale Challenge wouldn't be possible without the support of some key personnel, especially my Dean Cindy Munro, is the, or the Dean of the School of Nursing, who is very supportive of the Nursing Now campaign and all the work for the PAHO WHO Collaborating Center, as well as Marina Alvaro, Executive Director, who was the main coordinator of this uh, initiative, and my uh, office uh, personnel, Carlos Ar 
Service Mendel Program Manager and Amanda Miller, as well as the IT and Communication Department of the school. For this uh, University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Study Nightingale Challenge Leadership Development Program, the curriculum consists in a three-part lecture series of global nurses leaders. After the presentations, this was the initial plan and I will explain to you how we adapt after we started out with social distance and working from home. After each of the presentations, we divided the groups because we have a group from the United States and we had a group from Latin America, which one the first language was Spanish. So uh, the presentation from each speaker was uh, translated simultaneously. And after the presentation, we divided, and one group, the English speaker, will um, meet with the actual speaker, and the um, participant from Latin America will be participating in a discussion about leadership with myself. Um, every um, presentation was planned to be in person as well as in Zoom since the beginning because we have face-to-face -face participants, but we also have the participants from Latin America that will be connected through Zoom. And the main uh, topic for the discussions was focused on the role of the nurses in leadership. We have the pleasure and the honor to have three great speakers, okay? In our first section, well, we started with Dr. Patricia Brennan, who is the director of the National Library of Medicine from the National Institute of Health. And she gave us a presentation about visualizing living and working space, a strategy to support patients with chronic disease. This first lecture was as was supposed to be. It was face to face. We had the pleasure to welcome Dr. Brennan to the school and she did uh, her seminar. And after that, she had a luncheon with the uh, participant from South America, plus um, the faculty member at the school. And I um, guided the discussion about leadership with the Latin American attendants. Mm -hmm. For the second section, we had the pleasure to have Dr. Barbara Stillwell, and we are very thankful that even though most of the participants were uh, in Zoom because uh, we were starting to do social isolate, um, distancing, I'm sorry, um, she was able to come to the school, okay? No hugging, no kisses, like it's very common here in South, in South Florida, but we maintain social distance, but we had the pleasure to spend time with her. What we did different for this time is that Dr. Stilwell had opportunity to answer questions to the Latin American attendants with the use of the translator as well, and she had at the meeting uh, with the South Florida attendant in English. So uh, it was a little switch, but still she was able to come here to, a school, uh, to the school and uh, gave her presentation. Our last but definitely not least presenter was Dr. Elizabeth Madigan, the Chief Executive Officer from STTI, Sigma Theta Tau International, that uh, talked to us about Nursing Now and the Global View. You can imagine how powerful were these three presentations for any early uh, nursing leader in Latin America and South Florida. For Dr. Elizabeth Madigan, uh, what we did was that after her presentation, she had about an hour, it, it, it was planned like 30 to 45 minutes, but it took about an hour to answer questions to the um, participants in English. And it took about an hour and a half for her to answer all questions to the participant from Latin America. It was very interactive and it was very successful. It was a lot of questions uh, after her presentations. Recruitment. Our recruitment uh, focus first, uh, our dean um, was sending emails to the main community partners that we have even here in South Florida to identify uh, racing uh, leaders in each of the community partners to be recommended for this program. Our school has been a PAHO WHO collaborating center since 2008. So we focused and we extended the invitations to our collaborating partners in the region to identify um, early career leaders in Latin America that could be joining us through this experience. 
Originally, um, we were expecting about 20, but we ended up with 42 participants, six from South Florida and 36 from Latin America. Here you have the distribution of the participants. We are very happy to have some countries like El Salvador, Mexico, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, and the participants from the U.S. Um, this was very, um, we had very enriched discussions, but one of the things even, um, I have some feedback from the participants, something that in Latin American countries is very important, that these early nursing leaders, a lot of them manifest and verbalize the lack of mentorship. They say they have the energy, they feel they wanna do things, but they don't have the right guidance or the right tools to keep going. So definitely this program and the future program that we're planning to do for them, we give the necessary tools for them to keep going and advance nursing in Latin America and the Caribbean. Challenges, well, I am very proud to say that we didn't have that many challenges because as I discussed at the beginning, we were already doing part of the presentation in Zoom. So uh, once the COVID-19 um, restrictions came, we basically moved all the presentation to Zoom, but we already had the translator since the first uh, meeting, and we already have the IT personnel working with us. So we didn't have that many challenges. Uh, probably now the big challenge is to continue in contact with these early nursing leaders to provide more education and more tools for them to keep going in their nursing uh, career. Here is some presentation of Dr. Brennan, I'm oh, sorry, a picture of Dr. Brennan with some of the South Florida participants. Uh, here to the right, you have our Dean Cindy Monroe, and we also have Dr. Hushman, who is the Associate Dean for DMP or for Advanced Practice at the school, and the other ones were participants of the challenge. Here we had the pleasure to have Dr. Stilwell, and also with some of the participants that came that day, and myself to the left. So here I just put some feedback that I think was very uh, good from the participants. Magali Miranda Avila is a founder and president of the National Federation of Chilean Nursing Association. She told us that the Nightingale Challenge offered the possibility of bringing visibility to our work, of establishing communication with nurses globally, and of promoting the vocation of service in the next generation. Jasna Palmeiro Silva, registered nurse at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, told us that the Nightingale Challenge is a huge opportunity to receive high quality training from one of the most prestigious universities in the world. This challenge not only helps me to serve as a leader in my field and to strengthen nursing as a profession, but also to influence new generations of nurses who seek solutions to global health challenges. And last but not least, Juan Carlos Reyes Martinez, supervisor at El Salvador National Hospital. I joined the challenge because it gives Latin American nurses the chance to contribute to important issues facing the profession. Nurse leaders are the nexus between the patient and the healthcare team. They need decision-making opportunity and to see themselves as a fundamental and important part of care processes. So um, we are planning to continue working with this group of uh, attendants or participants of the Nightingale Challenge. We already sent a Qualtrics survey, asking a little more information about the demographic of the participants. We sent the program evaluation, and we also sent an instrument to measure their current leadership skills. As part of the PAHO WHO Center, we developed a leadership online course that has been very popular in the WHO virtual campus. And we have a plan for all of them to take this leadership course. And as part of their participation, we want them to evaluate the course. And what we're gonna do is that after they evaluate the course, we want to hear what, was, what did we miss, if we missed something, how we can improve that course for early career uh, nursing leaders. So that is the plan to have it, to do it during the rest of the, this year and next year. And hopefully we are gonna be hosting our PAHO colloquium
Innovation Research in 2022, May 22 here in Miami. And we hope to have a future leadership workshop during that colloquium. Otherwise, we will maybe have some webinars to keep giving instruments and tools to this group of nurses that they have the full energy and they are very capable of being the future of our profession. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, that again was equally inspirational and uh, it's so great again to hear what you're doing and that you're evaluating the initiative and you're learning, you're connecting with other parts of the system um, and, and that you're kind of in different countries from the get-go, which, uh, which is most impressive. So um, thank you so much and I'm sure there will be questions to come as to how on earth you achieve that uh, in such short time. So excellent. Uh, well done to you. Thank you for sharing that super work. So now we move on to our, our third esteemed speaker, if we can get the slide set up um, for that, um, Anthony. It's uh, Anna Julia. Brilliant. So, um, Anna, Anna, that super. Your um, your slide is up, and now it's it's over to you from the Albert Einstein. Thank Hello, you. Everyone. I'm Anna Jule. I'm the coordinator of the Nightingale Talent Program at ISIS. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share with you about our experience. Uh, let me. Okay, I will start showing you information about our country. Brazil is the sixth largest country in the world and the largest country in South America and Latin America with 3.2 million square miles, over 200 million people spread in 26 states. Sao Paulo is where we live. It's the richest Brazilian state responsible for 34% of the Brazilian GDP. It's the most populous state with more than 46 million inhabitants in 2019. The capital is the city of Sao Paulo, that is the ninth most populous city of the world. The Sociedade Beneficente Israelita Brasileira Albert Einstein is a non profitable health institution based in the city of Sao Paulo since 1965. We are a healthcare research and education institution that was the first hospital outside the USA to obtain the Joint Commission International Accreditation. It's set by three high complex hospitals, primary care units, and also checkup units. We have over 15,000 employees, which 70% are women. 32% nursing staff, which 35% are nurses, registered nurses. And the three hospitals together, we have private hospitals and public hospitals, uh, have over a thousand beds. The private one has over 600 beds. We are an early adopter of the challenge. So 20 nurses from different areas from Einstein were selected to be part of the Nightingale Challenge. The training and development program is focused on developing three key competencies in the group. The first one about systemic reasoning. The second one about interpersonal efficiency and soft skills. And the third one about care and personal. Uh, our program has been shared through events around the world and it was also used as a benchmark in other Brazilian hospitals. We started selecting the nurses one year ago. They started the first part of the program in September 19, 2019 and they finished in November. The second part of the program should have been started on March, but with the outbreak, we have to change our plan and wait. Uh, now I'd like to show you the COVID-19 timeline in Brazil. 
On February 24th, we, the first case was detected in the country in the city of Sao Paulo at one of ICEN's units. On March 10th, we were with an increasing number of cases and hospitalizations, so we decided to postpone the meeting scheduled for March 18th. Also because frontline nurses are part of our group, on March 24th was the beginning of the quarantine in the state of Sao Paulo. As you can see now, Brazil is the second country with more cases in the world. So we are still at a critical moment here in Brazil and hopefully we are now at the top of the COVID-19 curve. Uh, about the next steps, we are respecting this difficult moment and the dedication and hard work of our nurses to return with the program. Uh, according to specialists, June must be our worst COVID-19 scenario in Brazil. Uh, we still have uh, 147 hours of training left. Uh, they are being asked to complete a project with, the, with their own work environment too, so we had to redesign this. Uh, we are postponed this to August. We use it to do three presentations, two, two present meetings per month, and now we are planning to change it into virtual meetings to keep everybody safe. We have a good example here, our College, uh, our nursing college has changed the classes into virtual classes. So we would like to keep this good experience in our development program. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for the effort to attend at a such particular moment for health professional in the world and stay safe. Anna Julia, thank you so much for that presentation and again brilliant to see that you've got plans um, to continue the program despite the huge challenge that clearly you're, you've faced and continue to face um, within your country. So thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts as well for making the time to be with us and we very much see the Nightingale Challenge um, as a network, as an opportunity to listen, learn and share. And, um, and I've just learned an awful lot, you know, from all three presentations about the different perspectives um, and what nurses and midwives are facing in these countries. So thank you so much, Anna. I'm now going to go to the, we've got a Q&A, well, I've got a Q&A um, box on my screen. I don't know if others have got that, but I'm, I've got 10 questions in there at the moment. And, um, and Anthony, if you can keep us to check on time, because I think we'll switch off at, uh, at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. Is that right, Anthony? Yep, that's right. We've still got, we've still got a bunch of time. Great. Okay. So um, if, if people can get, go on to the Q&A box, if you've got one, um, then we'll, we'll start at the top and maybe we can um, decide between us which person takes the question on the panel. So just as a reminder, you've got the three speakers on the panel, Matt and myself. So the first question on, on the um, chat, on the Q&A, is uh, a request to please make a series of lecture on policy and development um, and application to nursing and on YouTube channel with top MBA colleges of the world. Well, that's a, a fantastic um, suggestion and possible aspiration for, for the Nightingale Challenge. Um, if that speaker is able to talk now, is there anything that you wanted to, to add to that idea? Um, the attendees aren't able to, to, to speak, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Oh, apologies for that. Well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely take that thought on board. Thank you for posting it. Our second uh, question is from Shirley. And I remember Shirley speaking to you prior to the launch of the Nightingale Challenge um, nearly a year ago now, is, is a question about workshops. So, so what about workshops? Um, Matt, do you want to, to answer this question? Yes, certainly. Um, workshops are really important because as well as there being a like a taught um a taught element you know a classroom element of this workshops 
um, can give you snapshots into particular areas, particular skills, and anything that can be used, because not everyone has got the facilities and resources everywhere around the world to, to use whatever you, you know, to use in a certain manner. There is no set way of the Master Girl Challenge. Use whatever is available to you. Um, workshops are incredibly effective, especially if you're bringing in experts in as well to share with this, because it also gives you that um, that element of learning for themselves, for the participants as well. So yeah, I, I would really recommend workshops. Very useful tool. Thanks, Matt. And in terms of what we're trying to do here and now with this webinar is, is almost to create mini, <coughs> mini workshops um, through this kind of forum. And I can just see Julie nodding. Julie, your organisation is a UK wide organisation. Do you have similar ways to deliver workshops um, for lots of people in different places all at once? Um, we, we do um, and as part of this uh, challenge we've obviously needed to do uh, the workshops virtually. Um, I think that um, in the UK we do have technology not just for our organisation but um, across uh, the providers of uh, palliative and end of life care which is the specialty that um, obviously we uh, we focus in on and there's lots of opportunities and over this pandemic period actually there's been lots of different organisations organizations that have shared their knowledge uh, quite generously across different organizations um, and some have used um, different platforms for doing that. Uh, we have lots of uh, uh, participants that are part of what's called communities of practice uh, and they often use the ECHO uh, platform for doing that um, and also uh, we uh, do support um, some of the multidisciplinary uh, discussions uh, within our local communities uh, linking in with hospitals and community providers and social care providers to actually share our knowledge um, and we feel certainly over the pandemic this has really helped us to do this quite in a quite a generous way um, so I think you know sharing knowledge workshops and master classes and just making that available to people is very important Thanks, Julia. And um, we will take this away um, within the Nightingale Challenge team to think about sharing some maybe top tips and examples from different countries about how do you get that connectivity and build that community of practice when we're very busy, there's a lot of anxiety, and, and let's face it, there's always lots to do for lots of us. So um, that's, that's something that we can certainly build on. But we do feel with the Nightingale Challenge, we've got such a fantastic resource, nearly, with having nearly 30,000 young nurses and midwives signed up, we want to try and harness all of you and, uh, and really create solutions that are going to be helpful to your practice um, and for you also to showcase and share some things that have worked really well for you. Um, so uh, that, that's what we're trying to achieve. So please look out on the website, but also if you've got any ideas or anything that you want to share, then just let us know and, and we can find a way to, to get that message out there or get those good ideas out there. Thank you for that, Shirley. Um, the, next, uh, the next question that I can see we've got, and there's a couple in the chat box that have asked this question, is about whether we can expand the Nightingale Challenge until 2021. Well, Nightingale Challenge sits within a bigger program uh, which is called Nursing Now and Nightingale Challenge is one, one element of, of the Nursing Now program as I'm sure all of you know and there are currently discussions with the Nursing Now sort of governance board people to decide what and how and if that's possible but there's certainly been lots of conversations about it and we recognise that to finish in December um, will be really tricky for lots of people. So what I would say is look out for further information. Once we get the clarity, we will share that out um, to yourselves. But also remember when we started the Nightingale Challenge a year ago nearly now, we said that the real success, one of the real successes will be if people want to continue to do this and you know that actually employers and early career nurses and midwives academics um, service leaders see the power and the benefit in this and learn from this um, to move forward so i would say don't let this this hold you back 
but we will get the formal note out around that decision as soon as we we know ourselves so so thank you for thank you for asking um, the, sort of the next question that I can see, Shirley, I think there's another one from you. Um, if we can elaborate more about virtual sessions and ideas apart from lectures. I think I'd like to take that away and, and have a think about what are the ways we can create virtual communities of practice, uh, particular technological databases or platforms that enable conferences to occur maybe in a festival format over a number of days. I think the world is learning rapidly about how to stay connected in this climate and, and we, will, we will look to um, make the most of that. But we really do want to keep in touch with you, keep connected. As a minimum, we will be putting on Nightingale Challenge virtual events of one kind or another throughout the year. Um, but again, any ideas or if anybody on this call would like to present or be part of something like that, then, then do let us know because we learn as much, if not more, from you, I think, um, through these things as you perhaps do from us um, organising them. I don't quite understand the next question, which is how long have you started caring online? I don't know whether that links to the health and well-being agenda that we we started to create health and well-being tools um, and signpost opportunities as COVID came to be in because of you know the, the stress and the strain of COVID and the fact that we've all been thrust into massive change um, so quickly. Um, but hopefully we do care um, and we are looking to provide, you know, things that help, help us to care for each other and with each other. And I think one of the interesting um, spin-offs of that has been the poems agenda, which literally um, has been submitted um, by a young nurse onto our website. But Anna, I just might come to you at the moment. You're really in the thick of, of the COVID uh, challenge in Sao Paulo. Um, are there any particular initiatives that you're, you've created for your early career nurses and the wider multidisciplinary workforce to help ensure that we be kind and compassionate to each other, as well as to our patients and, and their families in this time. So I don't know, Anna, whether you can hear. Maybe, maybe Anna's struggling with technology. How about Yonis? What about that question sort of similar for you? Obviously, you're, you're not at the same place in terms of the spike at the moment of, of COVID-19, but no doubt it's been you know, very difficult in your, in your countries that you're working with as well. Are there any particular kindness and compassion initiatives that you have, you have created for your early career nurses and midwives? Yeah, we definitely, one of the main things, we don't want to lose the momentum, okay? And we don't want to lose those participants that they are full of energy, as I previously mentioned. So we're going to keep the contact with them. And we are going to follow up, as I said, the survey. We're going to keep doing webinars, you know, uh, through Zoom. And here, like listening more from them, what are their needs to try to provide, you know, most, more education, more training. And the most important thing is that that we have to listen to them because they are the new leaders and if we don't listen we won't be able to plan accordingly great that's that's really good to know and Anna I don't know if you're back with us and whether you heard or you want to say anything don't worry if you're struggling with the technology it, it happens to us all <laughs> I had a problem I'm back sorry okay. did you hear the question Anna no, no, sorry. No, you were just talking about caring and kindness. It was one of the, the questions in the box. And uh, I, just, I just sort of posed the question to you, given that you're right at the spike at the moment with COVID. And I just wondered if there are any initiatives that you'd put into place around compassion and kindness and health and well-being for early career nurses and midwives and their wider teams. Um, given given the stress of just kind of going to work and, and living in this strange way as we are doing at the moment. Yes, we have some initiatives here, not only for the group, but also for all the nurses of our institution. We have um, 
a phone number where they where they can call wherever they want to talk about their feelings. We are, we have a group of of multi professional a multi professional team that are caring about our our professionals. We are having a difficult moment here. We all most of our nurses are with fear of what we are having and it was a, a good way to to be better to feel better about this thank you so much and um i think the helpline sounds incredibly powerful that people could ring up and and share with somebody in a safe way how they're feeling at the moment so Anna, Anna, if there's any more information you want to share with how that was set up or anything that you feel would be useful to share with the rest of the, the Nightingale Challenge community, we'd, we'd love to hear that. And uh, wishing you, you know, I hope things really start to settle for you very, very, very soon. Thank you, Anna. The next question we've got is, is from Debbie um, Cromack, and I think, Debbie, we know each other. Um, you've talked about carrying on the programme to 2021, which we've already addressed, um, but it sounds like you've got a number of exciting elements. I've not heard of a dragon boat racing or an art exhibition, um, and looking at the, the eyes of nurses um, in different ways uh, with your partnerships in Kenya. So I think that could be a future webinar to share uh, with us. I think we'd, we'd love to learn more about those initiatives. And as I say, sort of, you know, I think keep going with this program because it strikes me that the value add for doing it anyway is, is evident and probably even more important as, um, as we start to grapple with the perhaps aftermath of, of COVID. So thank you for that question. Um, the next question that I can see here is, do we have a Nursing Now Challenge in Africa or Nigeria? You would love to be part of it. Um, well, we certainly have got programs in that neck of the woods, but if you'd like to drop a line to the Nightingale Challenge team through the website, we can connect with you and explain to you where in Africa we've currently got programs. Um, and maybe, you know, you could have a, connection with with people there um, I was in in Uganda um, it seems ages ago now earlier in the year and there's a real strong program um, in Uganda that uh, that I'm sure would be really excited amongst others to share what they're doing with you the next question is um, is around based in a large acute hospital in Ireland You've not been able to participate since March in the Nightingale Challenge. And again, you're wondering if it could be delayed and feel behind. Well, first and foremost, I'd say please don't feel behind or, or feel anything other than this is nobody's fault. This is something that's happened in spite of all of the best plans. Um, you know, please reignite the programme when it's ready for you. If you want to contact the Nightingale Challenge team, uh, we've got lots of resources, as we mentioned earlier. We can help you, you know, get, get, get going again with the programmes. And I think it's, it's important, and I think, Julie, it might be helpful for you to come in here about, I really took your words to heart when you said it's nice to do something other than COVID and, and maybe from your senior position, how would you, what advice would you give to a, a young nurse or midwife that wants to convince their manager that uh, this is the right thing to be doing in these times? Yeah, no, thank you, Lisa. I mean, I think it is um, sometimes a question of timing. Uh, so, you know, when we're in the thick of it, it is actually sometimes really difficult to focus on anything else other than, you know, what we need to do to provide care under quite difficult circumstances and just making sure that our staff have the right PPE and that they know how to use it safely and that they are also well supported from their own health and well-being. But I think what we're learning that as the uh, pandemic and the epidemic in the UK is beginning to subside a little, um, actually it's been really good to start to focus on different things. So I would just encourage people in their teams uh, to start to talk about different things and really start to think about the future uh, and to get their, their nurse leaders 
um, also excited about that because I think actually it can become quite tedious um, if we're just focused all the time on infection prevention and control and all the things that we absolutely need to do to keep our patients and our staff safe. But um, alongside that, as, as things become what, what we would call business as usual, then it's very important that we start to think about the future and start to think about how do we adapt what we're doing in a way that actually is helpful to our, our young leaders uh, and also encouraging others, uh, not just the leaders on the, the, the development programme, but also those around them to start to focus on some different things. I think that's really important for our, our own health and well-being, actually. Thanks, Julie. That's helpful. And the next question is on a similar vein for you is, you know, what are almost your top tips for persuading senior leaders to mentor new nurse leaders? And I, I'm really curious to, to learn how you did that. Yeah, I, I don't think we had to persuade people. Um, I think actually some of it is about how do you position the request really um, and how do you um, have those conversations with people. I suppose in Marie Curie, because we're a relatively small organisation, we can connect with people very um, uh, easily and uh, everybody is uh, interested in the values of the organization and what we're actually trying to achieve um, and so what was important for us it was, was to ensure that people part of part of the organization that was outside of caring services which is where we provide the direct care to our patients and our families um, so our fundraisers our retail sector um, all the um, staff that are in our corporate services um, that help us to do the things that we do every day um, um, and actually by just advertising that uh, the senior leaders came forward and were quite keen to understand more uh, and actually the mentors are getting just as much out of it they're learning from our leaders uh, and our aspiring leaders much more about nursing and the value of nursing mm. and what nursing contributes to a person's experience and we very much uh, see that although the interaction is really important for us it's about what matters to the person that we're caring for um, what matters to the family uh, and um, we can have those conversations with people and for our fundraisers our senior fundraisers it's really important that they actually hear that it's really authentic the stories of our nurses and the way they care for people actually helps us then in our fundraising ability as a charity so connecting those things together actually is a no-brainer or something that we do naturally and so I think our senior leaders really were very grateful and came forward in 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 numbers and we were then able to match people um, quite carefully so that we selected the mentors and the, the people being mentored uh, quite carefully and matched them so I don't think it was a very difficult job for us to persuade Brilliant. Um, yeah great thanks Julie well it would be great to learn more about your journey and maybe get a blog from your chief exec and some feedback to share with the young nurses to see the value of from the other side because I think that's really powerful what others get out of it as well to be on the other the other side of that thank you we're coming near to the end and there's more questions Anthony can I just check that these questions won't get lost when we get switched off because there's some brilliant questions and ideas in here that I really want us to to look at in more detail but I think the final question Yonis I'd like kind of to go to you which is about about sort of the research and education bit and what what's your kind of top tip for getting research and involved in the Nightingale Challenge because I was very taken with your your evaluation strategy and your link with the WHO Collaboration Centre. Well, I think if we are going to talk about research, first we have to focus on what are the gaps that are out there for implementing leadership programs like the Nightingale Challenge. You know, we should learn from all the programs and probably we can just come with a multi-site study in the experience from the different type of programs and then probably make a more improvement or an instrument or implementation that is going to be more across the globe. As you see in the chat, a lot of people are 
uh, still with interest in participating in this program. Just we have to learn from what we have done so far to try to improve and actually to make sure to measure the outcome. What are the participants gonna really get after we complete this challenge? That's why even with the or three series, our work is not done. If you see, it's a lot of more that we have to focus on because we already, um, we were lucky enough to get these people attention that are participating with us so we cannot leave them there we have to keep with them and help them uh, you know to progress and be a better nurse a better leader tomorrow brilliant that i think that's a superb note to end on can i just say a huge thank you to such an esteemed panel it's been a real treat to be on this uh, virtual panel with you and to all of the wonderful people from all you know so many different countries that have tuned in to listen to this we will take everything on board and make sure we get a way to answer the questions that haven't been answered uh, thank you all very much uh, please keep safe and well and hope to connect again with you soon on another webinar or some kind of virtual learning event thanks so much everybody bye bye